And we're back. Like we never left. Oregon fans, what's going on? How we living? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. It's Thursday, May 23rd, 2024, coming to you from Long Beach, California. We got a special episode for you guys. If you've been rocking with me for a minute, you know I've been building towards this. We are at episode 500 of the pod so i am super stoked to be joined by a very special guest who i will intro in just a moment but before we get into that you guys know the ducks dish podcast is brought to you in part by ranchito grill in springfield not sure what your dinner plans are tonight but head on over to ranchito at 1537 mohawk boulevard try out their homemade tortillas they got great food a great environment and they will take care of you Say what's up to my guy, Ruben, and tell him that Max Torres sent you. All right, guys, I've built up the anticipation long enough. I am joined by college football analyst Yogi Roth, the man, the myth, the legend. Yogi, how the heck are you? Thank you so much for being here. Max, it is a pleasure. Uh, I've loved how we've got to know each other a little bit. We've talked about getting on. Uh, You've been so gracious with your time, and thank you for inviting me and dealing with me and um, all the moving parts that, that come with scheduling somebody. Looking forward to talking and definitely connecting to you and your audience. Absolutely. Well, the, the pleasure is all mine. I know we were talking a little bit before we hit record here. We met a couple years ago down here in Southern California at Pac-12 Media Day. And and ever since then, it's been great to just kind of run into you uh, at the Elite 11 every now and then. I know you you have that event that you're closely tied to. So I'm super stoked to have you on. And uh, as our 500th episode, kind of wanted to do something special. So once you gave me the green light, I thought, uh, what better occasion uh, to have you on? So we're going to talk some Oregon football. Obviously, that's what my listeners come for. And and that's what I like to to hit on. And and maybe some big picture stuff as well with college football and and, and everything that's going on. So I want to travel to Eugene here to, to set the scene, if you will. Obviously, you've been there uh, plenty of times, as have I, but I want to get your perspective on Autzen Stadium and that game day atmosphere. To you, Yogi, what do you think makes Autzen so special? Oh, God, what a, what a question. Um, I, I have so many memories of that place. Like I remember being up there when Mark Sanchez made his first start when I was coaching, and he threw a pick on an option route to the tight end anthony mccoy that sealed the win for oregon which was a huge moment i think for that program because sc was rolling uh at just a unique clip then I, that might even been like year one of chip kelly as their offensive coordinator i can remember being in the elevator with nick aliotti as a young coach being so intimidated at him saying hey how you doing son how you doing young man uh i can remember my first time ever broadcasting a game there and interviewing chip kelly down on the field and being up in the booth and then my most recent memory is one that's it would compete to be my greatest memory in football because I took our oldest son Zane with me on like a father son road trip for their spring game, which also happened to be my final assignment in my current deal with the Pac-12 as we knew it. And it was really cool to take him there for a game and let him be on the field and see, you know, all the pomp and circumstance around it and the motorcycle coming out and the sounds and the cheerleaders and the fans and spending some time with the players and, and coach Lanning. So yeah, man, it's awesome. And, and then I just go to football and I love calling a game there because it rocks. I mean, and, excuse me. It's not just when they play the song, everybody's going crazy between, uh, between quarters or at a TV timeout, but it's truly just an, a raucous environment. Uh, it's almost like when you get there, it's kind of like they lock the doors behind you, you know, the way the stadium is shaped. And I love that as a broadcaster of like looking down upon the stadium seeing those beautiful trees out in front of you, but then seeing just so many electrifying plays unfold. Like I see Marcus Mariota in my eyes. Now I see Tony Brooks, James, like a hundred and some yard kickoff return, DeAnthony Thomas, and of course, you know, the Dylan Gabriel and Bo Nix and guys as of late. So long-winded answer, man, but there's so much that that is a part of my DNA that, that falls in love with Austin Stadium. That's great stuff. That's great stuff. I think back to... Uh, I was there for the spring game as well. Recently, got to make that trip, and and just the feeling of sitting in the press box, and then that that uh, the view you have of all the trees and the greenery and the the mountains in the distance and whatnot. Um, that that's part of just what makes it special. And and to your point about it, they, they kind of close the doors behind you. You just feel like everything is there in that one moment. I love the motorcycle coming out, the Harley. 
that's my personal favorite moment. I, I still get goosebumps every time uh, I hear that. So I thought that was kind of a fun question just to get us started off because um, you obviously have a lot of experience at Autzen as someone who's been covering games there uh, over the, a number of years. So that was a fun one. I think another thing that I'd be curious to pick your brain about, if we're talking Ducks, what better place to start than at the very top? Talking about about Dan Lanning and the head coach of the program and, and where he's kind of have, where he has this team going. So before we talk about Dan, I kind of just wanted to preface it with a question of what do you think makes a, a great head coach? Again, it's kind of a loaded question, I know, but but what do you think makes a great head coach? It's a great question. Um, I wrote my master's thesis on it. Uh, literally, the title was What Makes a Great Coach Great when I was at SC in grad school there. Was, this is almost 20 years ago now, uh, but I still believe in the principles. And uh, they're, they're as follows. And, and to give you some context, I studied, of course, Coach Carroll, but John Wooden, Mike Krzyzewski, Phil Jackson, they were kind of like the, the people that I went to town on, like in terms of research at that point, had a chance to spend a little time with Coach Wooden, which is a powerful experience piecing this thing together. And Really, it came down to two things for me in that thesis. One was consistent, consistent in teaching, uh, uncommonly consistent is how I would, re I would phrase that now, whether it's how you walk into the building, how you talk to recruits, how you talk to your current players, how you navigate the new circumstances in college football, like how you deal with everything. Where's the consistency? Same thing as a parent, right? Second thing would be independent in thought. Those two things stand out dramatically. So independent in thought, I think, is probably the most powerful one. So let's just talk about Dan Lanning because that's who your audience um, is tracking on. He comes from this incredible coaching tree. Nick Saban, Todd Graham, Kirby Smart, Mike Norvell. I mean, there's a lot of different disciplines. His high school coach, who I know influenced him a lot, uh, his college coach, like call it six to ten people that have really poured into the poured into the tapestry, which is which is Dan Lanning. Well, a lot of times head coaches become a blueprint of what they felt was most successful. So an example, I can remember this when I talked to, uh, when Lane Kiffin went to the Raiders, for instance. Uh, I remember talking to a receiver who came from USC and he goes, in our first meeting, Lane basically said exactly everything that Pete said in Pete's first meeting. Well, now if you went to Ole Miss, he went to the first meeting, it would not be the same, right? It's evolved over time. I think a lot of times young head coaches just do and say whatever they've seen. Versus take the best stuff of whatever they've seen, but apply it to the core of who they are, independent in thought. And, and that's why I'm a huge fan of Dan Lanning. Like, I really believe that, man. Like, he, he is those things. Talk to any assistant coach, however much time they've been on one of his staffs, they would say he's so consistent every day. You know, that consistency is at an extremely high level. They're going to recruit at a high level. It's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be standards that you're going to have to meet. But it's not going to be and a lot of pro or not a lot of programs, but some programs are like this where you don't know the guy that's coming into the building. That's not good. Just like if you're a dad, my kids need to know bad, good, indifferent, whatever happens in their day at school, they're going to get the same voice, the same tone at home regardless. And we'll deal with every circumstance individually, but overall we'll have the same tone. So I, I think those two things I would land with. And then I think the third one now, if I was going to rewrite that, that thesis you'd have to be masterful as a communicator. And I do a lot of media training with teams and with, with executives and coaches. And a lot of times what I'll say is our first step is for you to get to know your voice, right? Like, does it feel weird when you watch yourself back in a podcast or you listen to yourself on your voicemail? That's step one, get to know it. Step two is mm -hmm. can you gain mastery around it? And that's where I think head coaches have to be truly masterful now. You don't have to be uh, the greatest orator of, our time, of all time. Like, you don't have to be Obama is the greatest speaker I've ever seen in my life. Dan Lanning is clearly skilled. Pete Carroll, clearly skilled. Like, there's certain coaches that are really skilled there. Some aren't like that, but they still have mastery as a communicator. And I think that is the third bucket that if I was hiring or as I advise people as they're looking for head coaches, I'm, I'm tripling down on those three areas. All right. Okay. So the consistency is, is obviously such a huge part of it. And I think that um, you see that in, in a bunch of different ways with Lanning, um, you know, just from people that I've spoken with on the staff around the program, from the recruiting aspect of it as well. I think that's another really interesting aspect of it is, you know, the recruits will tell you what's really happening because 
that's not their only option necessarily. They have a bunch of other schools coming at, at them. So it's a, an, an opportunity to get a very authentic, genuine perspective on a coach or a program. So I think that's another thing you see. And then the independent in thought, I thought was a really interesting component there as well, Yogi, because I think even though I've only been covering Oregon since 2018, I feel pretty confident. And I think a lot of fans would agree that Dan Lanning has really stepped into everything that makes Oregon authentically Oregon, the the Nike connection, the the city of Eugene, the tradition, but the tradition also kind of being innovation and one that's always changing and uh, just very, very unique. So I think that you see him ticking a lot of those boxes that, that make a great head coach, but at the same time, he's so young. So there's still so much more runway ahead of him. And I think I more so want to focus that on just him trying to get this program its first national title because that's obviously the goal. Yeah. Well, I think the best trait that young coaches can have is curious and open versus arrogant and closed. And I think it's a tough spot to be in because a lot of times young coaches, you're being criticized because you're young. You're being scrutinized because you're young. And you're also looked at as the guy who needs to have every answer because you sit in that chair. And every time I've been around Dan Lanning now, I I've known him for a long time. I remember when he was a GA at Pitt. We connected when he got to Arizona State as a young graduate assistant and, of, cor of course, tracked his career uh, fr from the very beginning. He's always and still is open and curious. A and I say that, and I'm not saying others aren't, but I think when you, if you interviewed Lane Kiffin now or uh, Chip Kelly now, like looking back on when they were thrust into the spotlight as a head coach, you'd have to ask him, but I would bet that they lean uh, probably closer to, you know, a version of arrogant and closed than curious and open. I just think that's, it's, it's so hard to sit in that chair. And I think now, again, because I go back to being such a skilled communicator, I think this generation of coaches are that because they've come up like that. Like I remember Mike Norvell when he was the offensive coordinator at ASU, same deal curious and open same way now like I, I think this next wave of head coaches are really are really clued into that they're really plugged into that because that's who they've they've been right as as young guys being able to ha ask different questions versus hey sit in your chair take the task do the job I think they grew up in a different environment in coaching and I think it's really allowed them to to adapt and, and thrive you just look at those two examples I mean those guys are killing it and then the guys that are now a little bit older, I mean, they look back on that and 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 they're they're a little bit more relaxed than probably they were at that time. And and I love that for the profession because it's good, especially with the fluidity of rosters. I mean, think by the time you hit publish on this podcast, like another bill might have been passed in college athletics. Like there's so much happening. And I think you have to be that way. You have to be that agile as a communicator and as a skilled leader to have a chance to really maximize uh, your roster and make sure you put people in a position where they believe they have hope to find success. The the curious and open part is is a big thing as well. And when you think about being uh, adaptive, adaptable rather, um, that's obviously so important with where the sport is at today. And we're going to get into a little bit of that in, in a little bit. But the open part, I mean, that's something that's been echoed um, even on a previous episode of the podcast, I brought in Carl Holmes Jr., who's the director of player engagement there. And he said that Dan Landing has an open door policy. And I think that fosters a lot of really strong communication between uh, staff and the players. And it just trickles down. I think it, it all starts at the top. If you look at any positive aspect of this Oregon program, I think it can really be traced back to Dan Landing and, and kind of the work that he's done. But another interesting aspect of a head coach, Yogi, that I want to talk to you about is uh, managing a staff. Because with Landing in particular, I think it's a little bit unique because he's young, uh, but he's been at some really empowering and really powerful stops. So how do you kind of make uh, make light of, I guess, how he has managed this staff? Because we've seen some departures, but I mean, for, for a reporter that's on the beat, I feel like he's navigated them really well. And, and that's a big reason that this team is still humming right along. A lot of what he's doing there reminds me of my time when I was at SC, just to, to refresh. I mean, it was an epic run. It was seven straight years of top four finishes. And I was talking to Coach Carroll earlier today and just kind of thinking back on that time and how it's been so hard to replicate for really anybody in the country, especially in a huge market and definitely on the West Coast. I say all that because it was a launching pad, 
a launching pad for everybody. Launching pad for me, look where I'm sitting now. The athletic director of Villanova is Mark Jackson, a launching pad. Think of Eddie O, Lane, uh, Sark. I mean, you just kind of go down the line of like Nick Holt. Like you look at a picture, like, bro, I have this picture from when I went to the Heisman with when Reggie won it. And you probably can't see it that well, but I'm looking at all these coaches and where they sit now. And it's head coach, head coach, head coach, offensive coordinator, offensive coordinator, been in the league for 20 years. Like it was a launching pad. And I say that uh, in, a, in a very endearing way because I think Oregon's the same way. I mean, look what happened with Kenny Dillingham. Granted, it was, it was perfect circumstance in terms of his hometown school and the school that he went to, but Will Stein's going to be launched out of there. Tosh Lupoy launched out of there if they want to. I'm not saying everybody wants to go be that head coach mm -hmm. because coordinators and position coaches now, uh, it's a different market than it was when I think back to you know receiver coaches, you know, maybe making a hundred grand. Now it's a different planet when you look at guys. So I don't I don't know if guys want to leave, but if they aspire to that next role in their career, whether it's coordinate, NFL, head coach, what have you, like I just look at the the staff and I just sit back and I say, okay. This is going to be the next this. This is going to be the next this. And knowing the circle of coaching, uh, those guys get offers every year to go places. They don't always take them because they love, to your point, like what Coach Lanning has curated there, which is an environment that fosters growth. I mean, I, I love his DNA traits. I mean, I just do connection, toughness, growth, and sacrifice. Like, because you see them playing out. Every coach has them. You know, that's so what I was talking to Pete about earlier today of like, we were talking coaching philosophies. And I ask coaches this all the time. I love asking coaches about this. My new podcast is going to be hyper-focused on that when it comes out uh, before the season of what coaches' philosophies are. And I love asking that question when I call games because it, 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 you know, it varies, but the depth is usually beautiful. Dan Lanning's is phenomenal. When I'm hearing a player on the sideline mic'd up talking about having a growth mindset in a game, as they did, I think it was two years, his initial year, I'm saying to myself, yep, it has landed. Like one of those DNA traits has landed. Connection. When Dan Lanning spent, you know, his first six months only connecting with players, when he makes sure that like the entire team is at his house, like almost a dozen times during an entire calendar year to foster connection. Like I, I just think it's, I just think it's authentic, man. It's not something you put up on the wall, and it's something that we're seeing in recruiting. We're seeing it on the field. We're seeing it win games. We're seeing it within the staff as they grow and grow and connect and launch or stay. Like I, I, I'm a huge fan of it. I think he is in, in the sport that doesn't necessarily have a star right now as a head coach because Nick Saban, you know, is, is no longer coaching. I think Dan Lanning's got a real opportunity and I would be shocked if he didn't do it in terms of, you know, from the public's eye, become that, you know, take up that space, take up that oxygen around that concept of, Who's the face of college football? Like, who are the stars in college football coaching right now? I don't think there's an automatic if you asked anybody in any region. Southeast, of course, would say Kirby. Southwest might say Steve Sarkeesian, right? The Midwest would probably say Ryan Day, uh, maybe James Franklin, because they've been there for so long. The West Coast, I think they'd say Dan Lanning right now. Um, but n the totality of the country, I don't think is agreeing or even being close to agreeing on the top two. And I think it's going to be fun this year to watch how the season plays out with this expanded playoff to see who takes up some of that real estate. And I think, I think Dan Lanning will. And it feels like Oregon and Dan Lanning have been launched into the forefront of the sport and maybe in a bit of a unique way, Yogi, because they haven't really had down drastically down years in, in recent memory, right? Uh, I think back to 2016, my freshman year of college at Gonzaga, Oregon went four and eight. Like that was the last really, really rough year, but they've constantly been on this upward trend. And I think when you look at two years ago against Georgia, the first game of the Dan Lanning era compared to now, you can see pretty significant growth. And I want to kind of parlay that into talking about the Ducks in 2024 here because they've had one of the strongest off seasons of, of any team in the sport. But granted, you don't win off-season national championships. You got to line it up on Saturdays and, and go out there and hit the road and win in tough environments. You, you know how it goes. So I kind of just wanted to transition that into getting some of your thoughts on Oregon in, in 2024 because it feels like they have the makeup and the momentum at that to really make a legitimate run at this whole thing. Yeah, I'll say this. If it was old school Pac-12 and, and having seen everybody's spring game on the West Coast, um, them and Utah are the two best teams I've seen with my eyes. 
right? And then you span the country, and I'm almost done watching every spring game and, and breaking down every team in the Big Ten because there's a lot of them. Uh, but they're, they're squarely in the dialogue as top one, two, three teams, depending who you ask and which way the wind blows, right? We know Ohio State's returning a ton. We don't know who the quarterback is. We know what Dylan Gabriel is. We know what this Oregon team is. I mean, they're, they're built to go have a shot to play for everything. And that's not going to stop. That's not slowing down. You look at the development. I think two years ago, they brought in 10 defensive linemen. Majority, I think nine of the 10 are playing a lot, right? Like you just look at the trenches. This team looks the part. When I was with Coach Aliotti at the spring game, he said, Yog, this is the biggest Oregon team I've ever seen. And not big and overweight, but big, athletic, strong, physical. Like th they have all those tools. I think at the receiver position, like they have just made jump after jump. Right? It's been a long time since they had a first team all conference wide out voted on by coaches. I think it was 2010 or something like that prior to last year with Troy Franklin. Uh, and now with Tess Johnson and company returning, I just, I'm a huge fan of where they sit. Schedule's not easy uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, they've got challenging games at home and on the road when you look at their schedule this season, but they will be in position for everything that they desire in college football. And to your point, they'll be in position in my eyes to bring home the first national title in Oregon football history. And that is not easy. The balls have to bounce your way. You have to stay healthy. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. We know how this thing works. The margin for, you know, error is, is slim, uh, especially if you get to the playoff and, and what seed you are and where you play and, you know, how the things shake out in terms of how, you know, just the overall health of the program and, and the players, but they are, they are not stopping. Like the Oregon Ducks are, I don't want to say they're pulling away from everybody, but they are, easily in that first you know those first two cars right is that if they're taking it around daytona like they're that first fleet and i don't see that changing at all uh i see them being in that for a long time and i love how dan lanning has really committed and recommitted and recommitted because he's had to in this landscape to what he wants to do which is raise his kids in that community and give oregon its best chance to do things they haven't done ever before and i think they will i i think they'll do that under his watch. I hope they do. I'm rooting, rooting for him and hope to be calling a bunch of those games as well, man. You use the word recommitting. You can also say doubling down. That's a big yeah. one I'd like to use this off season. And Yogi, apart from everything you see on the field, like the, the big additions, the, the five stars, the, the transfer portal guys, uh, being able to hang on to guys like Will Stein and Tosh Lapoy, those are all huge, but I think what might be the difference, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this, obviously, is the fact that he has doubled down on Oregon and that he looks like the guy who's going to be sticking around for the long haul. And, and that is something for as good as Oregon has been year after year, Yogi. It's just like it's it's faded away and it's kind of, you know, gone into oblivion in their hands. So I think that that's that could be the secret ingredient. And I think that that's something that needs to be talked about more. Yeah, well, look, I think we, yes, I agree. I don't think he's going anywhere. Uh, I think he wants to be there as long as he wants to be there. And I think Oregon is in a really healthy place with him there. And um, the entire athletic department is very aware of that. And and I love how connected it is. I mean, your AD, Rob Mullins, and, and here, you know, they're, they're in lockstep. It has to be that way, along with the school president, along with alums, donors, uh, the Nike element of this thing. Like, it just feels super connected. Uh, that's where my... My gut says every time I walk out of that facility. I think, too, is we have to look at reality of like, we're not living in the Joe Pa era or the, you know, n name the coach who's been there for 10, 15 years. Uh, it's just not true. Like, I, I think of UW and I always think of Chris Peterson. How long was he there? He wasn't there for a decade. I think he was there five, six seasons, right? People think of Urban Meyer in Ohio State. He was there forever. Or Florida, he was there forever. I think he was there at Florida for four years, right? Ohio State for four or five, maybe, you know, like, I just think that it's such a challenging job that to think somebody's going to be at a place for 20 years or 15 years is probably unrealistic. I hope it happens and, and maybe there'll be anomalies here and there, but will there be another Kyle Whittingham, you know, 20th season at Utah or Kirk Ferentz at Iowa? Like, I don't, I don't know, man. Like the job is, is so stressful. There's so many challenges um, and, you know, it can flip in a heartbeat. Uh, so, well, do I think he's going to be there 20 years? God, I hope so. I'd love to be in my late 50s and early 60s still calling games with Dan Lanning and grabbing a bite to eat before or after a game and talking about how our kids are in college. Like, that'd be blast. Uh, but who knows? Who knows how it shakes out? But I do love how he's 
constantly said that the grass isn't always greener. It's pretty, it was at the line, it's pretty damn green here in Eugene. I love that. And a uh, big fan of the hoodie, man. I need to get myself one of those. Yeah, it's, it's a unique time. And I think uh, I'm just grateful to cover a team like Oregon, one that plays pretty well, admittedly. And then uh, for, for me, like that recruits at a high level, I always love the stories that come along with that. So uh, I think it's shaping up to be a fun year. I mean, I can't think of another year where there's been this level of excitement, not only around Oregon, Yogi, but just college football, man. Like, it's going to be a huge, huge year. Uh, I know I got to get you out of here because you got uh, busy things going on. But um, anything to add before I let you go, man? Well, I just think that, like, I think like you and probably a lot of your fans, you know, I put a tweet out the other day of, like, how, how we feel about college football. And it was 98% negative. And, and I just say that I, I can't wait – to your point, like we get to the games, right? The sport in and of itself is under siege. Like it's transitioning and that's a good thing. Uh, it needs to transition. It's going to be a little rocky. It has been a little rocky. It has been dramatically inconsistent. Uh, there is inequities everywhere and inefficiencies everywhere, but you still can't mess with the games. And I think as a broadcaster, I often lean into the phrase, how great is ball? And to me, like the ball on a Saturday afternoon at Autzen or any stadium across this, this country, 53 and a third by 120, like you still can't mess with it. And that's what, uh, to me, always brings a smile to my face. And I think for the the fans out there that are like, God, I don't know about the sport and these players and the portal and NIL and all the things going on, all the money and the media rights. I hear you, hear you loud and clear. I lived it with the Pac-12. But the games, nothing can touch the games. And and I just urge us all to keep leaning into that. And, and this has become 365, 24-7 as a sport. But the games are still what allow it to be special. It's probably the reason you got in it. It's definitely the reason I'm trying to stay in it. And uh, and I hope we get to continue to celebrate that. And, and I'll do that as long as I possibly can if somebody continues to give me the chance to do that. And I'm looking forward to doing that again this fall. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Well, that's Yogi Roth. You can find more of him on Twitter slash X at Yogi Roth. If you want to find more of me, you can follow me at mTaurus Sports on all social media channels and read me at scoopduck.com. But uh, until next time, a huge thank you to Yogi for stopping by. Thank you to you guys for tuning in. And we'll see you in the next episode of the Duck's Dish Podcast.